Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. If we don't question and examine and try to grapple with the ways that we've been raised, that we are not satisfied with, that we don't like, that are damaging to us, um, if we don't try to take them on, um, I do think we're probably going to repeat them unconsciously. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Manaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 52, where it's light after we get out of work again. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Grace Talusian about her book, The Body Papers. Note that this was such a profoundly wonderful and amazing interview, I decided to keep all the great wisdom and split it into two parts for your listening pleasure, so please stay tuned for part two coming out in just a few weeks. Grace Talusian was born in the Philippines and raised in New England. A graduate of Tufts University and the MFA program in writing at UC Irvine, she is the recipient of a U.S. Fulbright Fellowship to the Philippines and an Artist Fellowship Award from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Talusian teaches the Essay Incubator at Grub Street and at the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts. She is the Fanny Hurst Writer-in-Residence at Brandeis University for 2019 through 2021. The Body Papers, winner of the Restless Books Prize for New Immigrant Writing, is her first book. I hope you enjoy this first part of the conversation as much as I did. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. I'm your host, John Monaster, and I am here today with Grace Toulousen to talk about her book, The Body Papers. Grace, say hello. Hi, everyone. Hey, Grace. Uh, thanks for joining me. I'm really happy to have you on the show. And I, you know, thought that this book was so amazing and powerful, and I'm really excited to get a chance to talk with you about it and I think a great place to start is just to ask you what this book is about, really, in your in your own words. Oh, thank you. Um, so this book is about secret keeping to me and what happens when you decide to let a secret out um, and, you know, all the things that we're not supposed to talk about. Um, that's, to me, what this book is about. Sure, there's content and topics about um, immigration, sexual abuse, uh, cancer, genetic diagnosis, and on and on. There's like micro racial microaggression. There's a lot of different topics that book is about. But to me, essentially, the book is about what does it mean to actually say what it is you're thinking and feeling? Um, you know, and if I can't say it, which is often the case, what does it mean to write about it and then to put those things out into the world? Um, and, you know, it's, I mean, I sometimes I'll look at the galley and I'll think, oh my gosh, I, I'm publishing this. I said that, like, I'm so used to writing to myself. Um, and, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's, uh, you know, this different experience for me to, um, put it together and to call it a book and to start having people read it. Um, but, but essentially the project is what if we spoke up, what if we talked about what our lives were really like instead of just going along and trying to keep relationships going well and pretending to be happy. Um, this is like about all the things I noticed, even when I pretended not to notice. Mm. Yeah. And I think that you write all of these things in a way that makes your story very incredibly powerful. And, and I wanted to take a moment and thank you for sharing it because you're doing something that most people, I would say, do not. Um, and, and bringing those secrets to light. Oh, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's a really scary thing for me to do, actually, and and to, um, you know, 
talk about or write about and publish these things that I that we don't generally talk about in polite conversation. But my hope is that there's a purpose to this, that, you know, it's not just like, let me like show my business or air things um, for revenge or because I want attention or any of those things. It's more like I would love for this book to reach someone, a reader that needed to hear it. And maybe they could speak up that day or think about speaking up or think about taking care of themselves in some way that they haven't been able to before. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great goal. Thank you. So, you know, once you and once you decided that that was kind of going to happen, that you decided that you really wanted to share your story, how did you go about putting the book together? You know, I know you have your MFA and, and you've been a writer. So, you know, I don't know if you've written other books, but maybe you could talk about those or, or how, you know, your writing changed, if at all, once you decided that this was now going to be a project and, and how you got to the end of the book. Sure. Well, I really, I feel like um, in some ways I tricked myself into writing this particular book. Like I did get an MFA in fiction um, and I've been working on fiction and novel projects for many years. Um, And, you know, some of them, I write them all the way through and they have not worked in some way. And so I have to like find another novel project to work on and practice and do that. Um, But all along the way, I, I wanted to publish stuff. And I wanted to get my work out there. And so I wrote essays, like short essays, and I started to publish them. And then one day, this is the story of how this book came to be, but I was um, on my Fulbright. I was with my friend Joanne, who is in the book. She's a poet. And I was complaining to her, um, or lamenting probably is the better word to use. Like I was saying, my gosh, I've been at this for so long. I don't have a book. At that point, I think she has had three books. Um, And, you know, I don't like to compare myself to other people, but we do. Like, it's a human thing to say, like, I'm this age and am I married or I'm this age and did I buy property or have children or whatever it is. So I was at that age and I was saying, oh, my gosh, what is wrong with me? I haven't published a book. And she looked over at me. She's probably heard this. You know, she's probably heard me complain a lot over the years about this. And she said, um, you know, you've published so many essays at this point, and they all seem to be about the body in some way. Why don't you put them together like a poetry collection and call it the body papers? And we talked for like five or 10 minutes. I put it together in less than an hour. Um, I had sections of different kinds of papers. Um, And then she said, like, you know, there's there's essay collection contests, just like for poetry collections. Why don't you send it out? And I think like by that day or a few days later, I did. Um, I sent it out. And like what I do with a lot of submissions, I just forget about it. I like send it out and then I forget I ever did it or I fool myself into thinking I, I ever did it. And um, and then I started to hear back about six months later that the manuscript was a semi-finalist or a finalist or all the, you know, and that gave me some feedback that I thought, oh, okay, there might be something to this manuscript. Um, Let me work on it a little bit more. Um, And then I did. And then I saw the call for restless books. And, um, and I think it was just like under the wire. And I sent it the essay collection there. Um, And as you can see, I'm calling it an essay collection. And we what what you read is called a memoir. And so over the course of about a year and a half or so, I worked with, um, you know, with the editors um, and publisher, Nathan Rostern and um, Elon Stavins of Restless Books pretty closely. And we really reconceived the manuscript and changed it, revised it, moved things around even to the very last minute um, to try to make it feel more like a memoir. Um, but I did not write the book as a memoir. I wrote it in pieces and then really revised it as a memoir later. Um, And so in some ways I I think of it as like, I think if I had ever said like I am writing a memoir, I think that would be for me and the person I am, I think that would be hard for me to say. I'm not someone who like takes up a lot of space in public. I have been trained to disappear in some ways and like be invisible. And so I don't know that I would be able to do that, but to sort of like, little by little publish essays and then 
with the help of, of people really dedicated to the project as a book, put it together as a memoir. That's what, what you have now is the, the body papers. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting uh, method of, of making that happen. And I think that's, uh, that is, I like the idea of you tricking yourself in that, you know, you took, you took, you had been writing these essays and you're sort of just like, well, what if I just kind of combined them and in, into a cohesive whole and, um, and sent them off. So that's great that, that other people recognize that they were very thoughtful and very well written and gave you that positive feedback to encourage you to, to move forward. Definitely. I mean, I don't know why, <coughs> I don't know why um, I'm like this. I mean, it's probably like in the memoir, it's probably evident at why I've become this way. Like I don't, but often people will tell me like, you're stronger than you think you are. I think like my perception of myself and what other people perceive is pretty different. And mm. I am, I am trying to, um, you know, see things as they are in reality and not see myself through such a, um, lens. I know it's not like socially acceptable to say that my self-esteem is low or whatever, but like I have to work really, really hard at, um, uh, you know, being able to perform, um, you know, this confident person in the world. And sometimes I do feel that way. I do feel confident. I do feel like, strong about the things I'm doing, but I do struggle also. Yeah. That's interesting too, that you mentioned that that phrase, I, you know, I had a friend that spoke with me about that phrase, uh, kind of you're doing better than you think. Like yes. when someone when someone tells you that, it's a little bit of a loaded phrase too because they're kind of impl implicitly assessing that you have low self-esteem or they're, they're, you know, they're, they're putting a mental model together about you that says that you don't really think highly of yourself. And yes. I think if people, if people hear that enough, then they'd start to, uh, you know, think that that's actually the case too. So I'm very careful about using that phrase now. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mostly, I heard it at, like sometimes in exercise classes and things like that. Um, that's mm. the place where it's more, it's like, I think I can only lift five pounds and this, you know, the exercise teacher is telling me like, no, try the 10 pound one. Right. And then so that's I, a very direct one. Yeah. 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 But the other ones are a little murkier and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, complicated. Fair enough. Uh, you know, the other thing I, I was just really impressed by was, you know, so not, you know, we'll get into your, your story, but even beyond the story, you were radically transparent about a lot of the documents and information. So you posted medical records of yourself and you, you, you know, submitted a FOIA request for your own immigration records, which I thought was quite interesting. I never heard of someone doing that. And, and you posted that information. Um, so you sort of, I feel, really elevated what a memoir might be from just talking about yourself to, in fact, showing documents about yourself. I mean, how did you make that that leap or what, why did you decide that that was important? I think that probably comes from some of my um, uh, training with journalism, which is mostly on the job. Like, um, And I, I don't know if this is true, but just thinking and I think I had this in my head that like I need three other sources. Like I, mm. if, if there's a fact or there's something that happens, I need to like confirm it in three other places. I have my memory of things and that's what a memoir is. It's writing based on memory, but I also want it to be, uh, do a little more than that and like check and find out because I think our memories are really strong and powerful and we believe them. And sometimes we might have dates wrong or we might have big things wrong or that are not factually correct. I just thought it would be really fun to look at my diaries, look at letters, um, look at my father kept files on all of us that had our report cards and papers and, um, you know, certificates from school and pictures. Like he also kept files on all of us children. And I wanted to use all that. And there were discrepancies all the time. I've been telling the story that I immigrated to this country or I came to this country when I was three years old. I've told that for most of my life. And then I get the, I get the FOIA request back and I'm like, no, I was two. I wasn't. Oh, three. wow. Yeah. That's yeah. A, I mean, that's a third of my life at that point. So that's actually significant. And, um, you know, there's, there's stuff like that and ages that I thought 
I received letters from people like, no, I wasn't 12. I was 10. I was, it's just like, you know, I, I, um, I wanted to be as accurate as possible and to see how that, um, you know, being faced with documents and facts, how that changed my memory or changed my relationship to the memory. Um, and then how did that, you know, what would I have to say about that? But, um, I, I, um, I also just thought it would be a way, interesting way to break up the text in the book to have, um, images and of, of documents as well as, uh, images of, uh, photographs in there. Um, but I, I think I, it's also a dare, like there's, you're not supposed to reveal your medical records. You're not supposed to, you know, like we're supposed to be ashamed and embarrassed of these documents from, um, INS immigration. And I want to push back against that. Um, and say like, no, we're not, don't have to be embarrassed and ashamed of these things. Um, you know, and it's not all my medical records. It's just the ones I felt you know, most comfortable with, which was the, the ones around, um, my genetic predisposition to breast and ovarian cancers. Yeah. Well, I think again, that's a very noble goal. And I think encouraging transparency and encouraging people to talk about all this. And I think this relates back to what you were saying about the book, you know, which is about not keeping secrets and, and talking about them. I think that's, it's all very connected. Um, so let's, let's talk about the book for a little bit now. And sure. I think, you know, you start off, the book doesn't kind of go from birth to now, you know, you, you just, it definitely starts off with, uh, you know, a grown up you and then kind of starts to go back and, and we learn more and more. So, you know, at the beginning of the book, you're living in Manila now, you've come back to Manila and, so I wanted to kind of check in on that. You know, how did you end up back in Manila? Uh, why did you think that that, you know, why, why did you decide that's something you wanted to do? Um, and then tell me about yogurt. You spend a lot of time very excited about yogurt, and I like yogurt. So I want to I hear about it. Okay. Um, well, the reason I went back to Manila is that um, I had a Fulbright. And I wanted the Fulbright um, I'd applied to it probably several times in my life when I was a student and a grad student and so forth. And I always had this idea that that was, if I was going to go anywhere in the world, Manila is where I'd want to go. I mean, that's the place where I was born. It's the place I spent the first couple of years of my life. It was a mystery to me. You know, my family, extended family, they have their, they have stories of Manila and this whole rich life back in the Philippines. And I wanted to experience it. We didn't go back and forth to the Philippines like some people I know. Um, we, we couldn't, so we stayed away for you know almost 20 years. Um, and then when we did go back, by that time I didn't have as much time. I had to work, and so I didn't have time to spend like lots of months and live there. Um, and I was always with my parents, so it was more mostly like from restaurant to mall to relatives' house. And I knew that I wasn't really experiencing the city. Um, and so I applied for a Fulbright. My friend, um, who's also Filipino American, he's a photographer named Jason Reblando, and he decided to apply the same year I did. And we said, you know what, neither of us are probably going to get it, but let's help each other. And so like, let's go through the application process together and like read each other's proposals and so forth. Um, and so we both happened to get it, which was really unbelievable. Um, I just was, I couldn't believe both of us got it. Um, and so we went there and lived together, he with his family, um, for almost six months, five and a half months. And it was um, incredible. It was uh, frustrating and difficult, and um, but also just wonderful and happy and like, you know, just a really, really great time. Um, I just like to be um, in the Philippines to realize, like, I don't know anything about the Philippines. I was there for five and a half months, but I don't know any, I mean, I really don't. Like, I know very little about the place and the culture and people, but um, despite all that, I love it. Um, I haven't been back since um, since then. Um, hopefully I'll go back in the next few years, but it's a place that I just feel so connected to and um, a lot of love for. Um, and, um, so in the yogurt thing, I, I was, um, I, I saw the yo I saw yogurt in the supermarket and it just looked 
really strange. It looked, it had like gelatin cubes in it. And I tried it. I didn't really like it. It was a little odd to have gelatin cubes in the yogurt. Um, and I think I just wanted to like experiment and do new things. And it seemed really off-putting to me, actually. It actually seemed like kind of disgusting to grow, to make your own yogurt. It seemed really gross. And But I thought, you know, I'm going to do things that I find challenging and I'm going to see what happens. And so um, a lot of people on this Facebook group of like Manila women expats um, were writing about yogurt. And then I thought, okay, like they seem really into this. So like, why don't I try it? Um, and I did. And it worked. I think it worked the first time I tried it. I followed the instructions. And then I realized that there was a lot of variation within that very basic recipe for yogurt, which I start the book out with. Um, you could use different kinds of milk to make the yogurt. You could use different kinds of yogurt, which has different you know, flavors depending on the kind of um, yeast or you know, yogurt cultures that it uses. Um, there was just like, it was something to do. And I had to wait for it. It wasn't instantaneous. I had to wait, you know, six to eight hours or so before my experiment, um, before I saw the fruits of my experiment. And so it gave me something to look forward to. Like I do it at night and then wake up in the morning and then see what happened. And it was like fun to do that. To, I felt like a kid when I would do experiments as a kid and like see if, you know, I don't know, the tooth fairy got my tooth or whatever it was. Um, so it's a lot of fun. And it's also like, I mean, I ate yogurt today because I've been, I've had, had pneumonia. I've been sick for weeks and I know that it's going to like help me start to feel better. There's protein and there's like, it'll rebalance hopefully like what the antibiotics took out of me. So, um, I don't know. It just seems like a really, um, kind of healing alive food that people have been making for hundreds of years. And I like feeling mm. connected to that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's great. I also enjoy yogurt. So <laughs> that, that makes me want to think about making my own yogurt now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's fun. So, yeah, I mean, I like challenges for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, one of the things that you wrote about while you were there was this idea of, you know, seeing pregnant women and, and how you were a little bit upset. You were angry. You were sad uh, because, you know, you weren't able to have children. You kind of alluded to your your um, breast cancer and ovarian cancer um, issues. And, and you kind of wrote in the book that in, instead of having children, you now aunt. And you've got all these nieces and nephews and this whole group. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted to check in on that. You know, how, how do you feel about being an aunt for, to so many different people? And and how has that given you maybe a different perspective on children and parenting than maybe what a traditional parent might have had? Oh, thank you. I love it. I don't, I can say now, I mean, I've been out of, out of that feeling of like being angry at pregnant women and sad and stuff. I don't like even on TV or on the movies or like on Instagram, I would feel like mad about it. I do not anymore. Like I'm, I can watch all those things, see people, and I, I don't feel that way. Um, but it took a while. It took a few years for me to work through that. Um, but I love being an aunt. I mean, I'm, uh, my, my nieces and nephews called me Tita. That's the um, Tagalog word for aunt. And, uh, and to me, it's a real honor to be their aunt. It is a very different relationship than being their parent. I am not there for the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, very intense caregiving and that, that my siblings and my sisters-in-laws and brothers-in-law have to do. But I know that I serve a different role. Like I have the attention and the resources and the time and the money to like fly out and see them um, at least once a year, if not more. I try to do like a, a circle around the, when I have my summer break from teaching, I'll um, like try to see everybody um, at least once or twice a year. And I try to talk to them and FaceTime with them. Not all of them, but I, I, there's a dozen of them. So, but, you know, it's um, a real honor to be in their life in a really different way than their parents are. And I listen to them. That's something, even as a kid, I tried to do um, 
and tried to practice. But, you know, I think that children, young people are told a lot of things a lot of the time and nobody, well, it's very difficult. Like I, I just see them get railroaded a lot. So I try to be very, um, and I, I want to give them advice too, but I try to be really intentional about listening to them. If I say like, Oh, how are you doing? Um, don't, you know, they, they start talking. I, I'm not to go into like all this advice about like how to raise their grades or whatever. I have to, you know, try hard not to give them advice because of course I want them to suffer as little as possible in this life and not make mistakes and go down these roads that could lead to terrible things. Um, but you know, in order to build a relationship with them, I think really listening, um, when they want to talk is, is important. And, um, that's something I definitely have learned that, um, I don't need to like keep track of all their activities or whatever. So I, I can sit and listen to them and whatever yeah. they want to talk about. Well, I think that that's absolutely key for, for all relationships really is, is knowing that there should be time for you to just sit and listen and, you know, it's something I think everybody struggles with. Yeah, there's this this sort of like innate human desire to provide advice. It's so interesting to me, I've noticed. And so I feel that, you know, that's something that I always work on as well is just trying to listen for a while. You know, let the other person talk themselves out almost and then, you know, ask them if they want advice before just deciding that you can solve the problem and, and give it to them. Definitely. I think um, I've started getting into the habit of, with, um, you know, would you like some feedback? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so, and you briefly mentioned uh, your childhood, and so I wanted to turn and, and talk about Boston. You know, your family moved to Boston uh, when you when you came to the United States, and so I just wanted to hear a bit about what it was like growing up in Boston. And you had several siblings that were then born in America after you moved. And, and maybe it'd be helpful if you could talk about how their experience was similar or different from yours. Sure. Um, we lived in Boston, in Mattapan, and um, uh, I think Roxbury or JP, I can't remember, when we first came to the United States. And then pretty soon after, when it was, by the time I was in first grade or halfway through first grade, we moved to the suburbs of Boston. And, um, you know, if when I look back at my, photos of my classrooms when I lived in, in the city of Boston. Um, it was mostly um, black and Latino folks. I was the only Asian person. Um, but his, when we moved to the suburbs, it was completely different. It was, I was the, the lone minority slash person of color, Asian person in the school besides my siblings. And so um, it was, um, and everyone else was white and and there were distinctions around being white. It was like you were Irish or you were Italian or, or something like that. Um, and so I always had an awareness, even though I was here since I was two, I always had an awareness that I was diff different, that my parents were different. They had accents. They did things differently than other parents. So I would go to other folks' houses and see how they lived. And it was, you know, there were differences in the ways that people talked to each other and, um, whether you took your shoes off and on, or whether there was rice every day. I mean, there was just all these big differences. So I always knew that. Um, but for my siblings who were American born, um, I think they probably thought they were American, you know, and thought they didn't really think of themselves as people of color, probably even until they were older, like in college. Um, and they, you know, did all the things that the other kids did and I don't think that they saw themselves as different. Um, there were, of course, probably many times when they experienced racial microaggressions or more um, and, you know, either decided not to say anything or didn't notice it or whatever. But even I was there, like one of my brothers, he was like 10 years old. He was playing with his friends. And um, I think three of them were white kids from the neighborhood. And one other kid was his only other Asian friend. And the white kids were calling him and his friend Gooks. And I think it was the time of like um, Born on the Fourth of July and like those Vietnam War films were coming out in the 80s. So I think that or I don't know where they learned that word, but they knew that they knew that word. They knew to call their two Asian friends that word. And I was really mad. I was either in college already or in high school. And I was like really surly and like, you know, talk to the boys. And it's like, this is wrong. Like, this is racist. And I was really mad at them. 
And then I was mad at my brother and talked to him later and was like, you know, why do you have friends that would call you that? Like, that's really awful. Um, he was like, I mean, he's a kid, he's 10 years old, so I kind of feel bad about it now. But, um, you know, I was really angry that we just would live with this, like, just get along and it's fine. And, you know, your friend can call you a racial slur and, you know, we're going to like play along like that's okay. Um, but there was lots of, I mean, lots of instances of that, that we just lived with because we wanted to get along with people. Um, yeah. and you know, that was, so I don't know, I think my siblings who are American born eventually did have to contend with, um, you know, being understand, understanding their identity as a person who is, you know, seen as Asian or Asian American or whatever in the society. Um, but I think they probably grew up with a level of feeling safe that I probably didn't grow up with because of um, not only my immigration status, but I just was always unsettled. Like I was, I'm always looking for like, what is the rule? What is the norm? What is the culture of like any room I walk into? And I try to figure it out really quickly so that I can get along with people in that room. Hmm. And you had spoken about your parents briefly and their decision to move you from Boston to the suburbs. Uh, in the book, you know, I, I was I noticed you know you you spoke about the change in in their behavior and who they were, and you kind of wrote that the parents of your early child disappeared, and new parents, unrecognizable to you, took their place once you moved to the suburbs. So maybe expand on that. You know, kind of what happened there? What was the change? Sure. I mean, they were undergoing their own transformation in their process to becoming American. And some of it was really annoying. Like, I didn't like how my mother would take on mannerisms of her white friends and, you know, speech patterns and things like that. Um, the, both of them started using a Boston accent. And, like, it really annoyed me um, because I guess because they weren't like my parents from before. They were like, transforming before my eyes into these suburban parents. Um, they got really into sports. Like my dad got into tennis to play tennis and you play with the neighborhood men. Um, they became like huge Celtics, Red Sox, Patriots fans. They became fans of, of all these sports teams, like wore the jerseys, had parties. And like, I tried to be interested in these sports, but I just, was not as excited as they were. They got really into it and I didn't understand it. Like they would even, like if we were going on driving trips and stuff, they would listen to the sports games and then like cheer and beep the horn. And it just was, it was like so exuberant. I wasn't used to these parents who were so reserved before and didn't raise their voices very much and, you know, just tried to like hide. They really blossomed in a way. And I think they were having a lot of fun too, in the suburbs. Um, there was all this space. We had like space and like my father was a doctor and had a good standing in the community. I just think they were like really enjoying themselves. And as I was like heading into my teenage years of, you know, wanting to rebel against things and being mm -hmm. irritated at everything. Uh, but when I think about it now, I have a lot of compassion for them. I think they were having a lot of fun and t trying on these new identities as Americans, even if they mm -hmm. would never be white Americans. No, oh, that's an, that's an interesting uh, point, and I think that that's something that that a lot of people tend to do anyway. You know, regardless of you know, if if you come into a new space, you want to integrate to some degree. It's like a natural, just like you said, when you enter a room, you kind of want to figure the room out and try and understand uh, because there's just like a I think humans have a natural proclivity to want to be part of the social group around them. Definitely. So I think that is. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, kind of the the flip side of that, I think, is some of what you talked about in terms of the the negative in, of your parents, in that they they had their own parents to deal with, you know, in the back of their mind and the way that they operated and how they worked, and kind of you you raise this idea that you know to some degree we tend to behave like our parents. We internalize some of what they teach us. And, you know, you tell this heartbreaking story about your father's experience with his mother, and, and you say at the end that, you know, despite his efforts to not be like his mom, he was sort of destined to fail. 
and I just wanted to find out why why you thought that was the case and and you know if if we can successfully extract ourselves from who our parents were yes um that when i heard when my father told me the story of what his mother had done to him this punishment that she did to him when he was a little kid he just told it to me in one line and it explained everything i just feel like i'd done like i've pretty much been in some sort of like therapy since i was 15 years old, continuously, maybe just like a breaks here and there, but pretty much continuously. And so, but that one conversation with him, I was like, Oh, I get it. Like all like that was really brutal the way she punished him. And he had never done anything that brutal to us. And it just made me understand like, wow, all this time he's been holding himself back. Probably like we may see, the ways that he's acted through this like other lens that says like, Oh, it wasn't enough. It was damaging and so forth. And yet perhaps for him, he's been holding himself back and like trying to do as best as he can and not do horrible things that he may want to do. Um, and so it just opened things up for me to hear him talk about that and say that. Um, and I do think that if we don't question and examine and try to grapple with the ways that we've been raised, that we're not satisfied with, that we don't like, that are damaging to us. Um, if we don't try to take them on, um, I do think we're probably going to repeat them unconsciously. I mean, as much work as I've done in therapy trying to understand myself and the ways I've been raised, um, I know that when I'm sometimes when, when I'm with my nieces and nephews, I think, oh gosh, I shouldn't have said that. Or like, there it is. Like I'm going into this habit of, you know, this bad habit of like making the world seem scarier than it actually is. Like I just, I know that I do things too. Um, you know, my nieces and nephews, they've told me their complaints about me, which I'm glad that they were either able to do that. I could never like voice my complaints to my parents about things. So, um, you know, but I know that even with all that, like I'm, I'm still very much um, do things unconsciously out of my own fears and anxieties. And I do think that's, you know, some of the ways that my parents acted out of was their fear and anxiety. Um, and, you know, it was, um, yeah, the, I mean, I didn't have kids. And so in some ways I took myself out of that whole legacy and equation, unless we mm. think about, you know, what I, my impact with my nieces and nephews. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah. uh, it's, I think it's really, really hard to not do things out of fear and, and anger and anxiety. And we just have to work really hard to not damage, to try to mitigate the damage that we might do with other folks. And maybe we do it and then we come back and we apologize. And that's profound also. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. Mm -hmm.